DNA, the fundamental molecule of life. It's so ubiquitous and we talk about it so commonly in our everyday life. It's really, really hard, I think, for us to understand how recently it was discovered and how really recently we understood what its purpose was. So it was actually only first isolated in 1869, which isn't that long ago. And then its role in hereditary, so passing on information from one generation to the next, was only confirmed in 1952. That is incredible. And it was in 1953 that Watson and Crick completed their model, which is now accepted as the first correct model of the double helix of DNA. And that image of the double helix is known by people across the world. Now, the story of how they discovered the structure of DNA and how it forms this double helical structure is a really, really fascinating one and one that I recommend that you read about separately. Watson and Crick received a Nobel Prize for their work developing the double helical model of DNA. But much lesser known and lesser talked about is the woman that enabled them to create that model. Rosalind Franklin's work on X-ray crystallography was central to Watson and Crick's ability to understand the molecular structure of DNA. And she was only mentioned in a footnote in the original paper that they published. As time went on and people really started to realize the importance that her work had had in their development of the model, there was some suggestion that she received the Nobel Prize, um, but it didn't happen. And then after her death, it became not really possible because Nobel Prizes aren't really given out posthumously. But she's a really, really important woman in the history of science and somebody who is well worth reading about. And there are a number of books and articles and documentaries about her if that's something that you want to look at. In this video, I'm just going to be introducing you to the basics. So we're going to look at the structure and function of DNA and RNA. Let's start with DNA. DNA is the basic unit of heredity in all cells. So whether we're talking about eukaryotic or prokaryotic cells, the basic structure of the DNA molecule is the same. So DNA is a long strand. It's a polymer of many, many, many attached monomers. So monomer meaning one, polymer meaning many, many, many monomers of nucleotides. And those nucleotides all share the same generalized structure. They all have a phosphate, a deoxyribose sugar and a base. The thing that makes them different is the base. There are four possible different bases for nucleotides. They can be adenine, thymine, cytosine or guanine. Here we see the basic structure of a nucleotide. We can see that the phosphate and the deoxyribose sugar are joined together by a condensation reaction. And the deoxyribose sugar is joined to the base by a condensation reaction. So DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid, and the first part of that name comes from the fact that the sugar that is present is a deoxyribose sugar. Now let's talk a little bit more about the bases. The bases can be put into two groups, adenine and guanine which are purines, and thymine and cytosine, which are pyrimidines. Purines always bind with pyrimidines. Now, what does this term purine and pyrimidine mean? It's to do with their shape. Both types contain nitrogen, but purines have a double ring structure and pyrimidines have a single ring structure. So purines have a higher molecular weight than pyrimidines, but for your A-level, you absolutely don't need to worry about that. All you need to know is that adenine binds with thymine, guanine binds with cytosine, and adenine and guanine are both purines, and thymine and cytosine are both pyrimidines. Now, when adenine and thymine bind together, a double bond is formed, and when cytosine and guanine bind together, a triple hydrogen bond is formed. So we have this slight difference in the bonding between the two molecules. 
So now we hopefully have a better understanding of the monomers of DNA, let's look at the polymer of DNA. You already know that DNA forms a double helix. And this double helix is not a single strand of DNA, but two wrapped around each other and joined together by hydrogen bonds to form this helix. We know that in eukaryotic cells, DNA is linear. That means it has a start point and an end point. And we also know that in humans, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And these are varying in length and they are massive. So for instance, chromosome one, which is our largest chromosome, is about 249 million nucleotide base pairs. That's huge. It represents about 8% of the total DNA that's inside human cells. Let's look at a single polynucleotide of DNA and how one nucleotide can become a dinucleotide and so on to become a polynucleotide. Okay, so as we've just seen, the bond between two nucleotides in one polynucleotide chain is formed between the third carbon on the deoxyribose pentose sugar and the phosphate group. So the third carbon as an OH group that binds to the phosphate on the next nucleotide in a condensation reaction. That bond that's formed is known as a phosphodiester bond. So just take a look at the carbons. If you count from the oxygen atom, you can see that we've got carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, and carbon 5. And you can see that the fifth carbon is at the top. So, so if we just think about it on this more simplistic diagram over here, we can imagine that this is the fifth carbon up here on the diagram. So where the fifth carbon is, that's always going to be the top of the polynucleotide chain. So we say this is the five prime end. We say this is the five prime end of the polynucleotide. And then if we look, we can see the third carbon is always going to be at the bottom. So if we think the third carbon is going to be here, it's going to be here. If there was another one, it would be here. So the third carbon is always at the bottom. So we say that polynucleotides run five prime to three prime. So that is the direction of travel when we're thinking about the formation of bonds as we're building up a DNA polynucleotide molecule. Let's now think about how nucleotides on the two different sides of the chain might join together. So DNA strands run anti-parallel to each other. So what that means is they both run five prime to three prime, but in opposite directions. It really helps to be able to visualize this. So one of the DNA molecules will be turned upside down in comparison to the other one. So let's just draw it out and check that we understand it and that we could replicate it ourselves. So we can see here that both strands run five prime to three prime, but one is upside down in comparison to the other. We call this anti-parallel. Just take a minute to take a note where each of the phosphodiester bonds are, and also notice the numbers of hydrogen bonds. To, so two hydrogen bonds between thymine and adenine, and three hydrogen bonds between cytosine and guanine, which we touched on earlier on. One final term that I've written on this diagram that we haven't actually mentioned before is the sugar phosphate backbone. So when we think about DNA, DNA has this sugar phosphate backbone that is made up of non-varying repeated units, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, and so on. It's only the inside of the molecule that is variable. It's only the nitrogenous bases that change. Obviously here, this is drawn as a single straight ladder. But that's just for ease of our understanding of it as a molecule. You know, of course, that in reality, it forms this double helical structure.
and also we know that this helical structure condenses in eukaryotes around proteins, these big spherical proteins called histone proteins, and then these histone proteins that are all surrounded and wrapped up in these this DNA strand, then ravel ar around each other and form this structure that we're very, very familiar with, which is the chromosome structure. And these chromosomes are packed inside our nucleus. So you'll notice I've written here, um, did you know that even though humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, all other great apes, including gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos and orangutans, have 24 pairs of chromosomes. This is because if we think back in our evolutionary lineage as great apes, at a certain point, two ancestral ape chromosomes fused at the ends, producing human chromosome 2. So human chromosome 2 is the equivalent of two chromosomes found in a gorilla, for instance. So sometimes we can accidentally think that humans might have the most or the best of anything, but that's certainly not the case with chromosomes. So we have 23 pairs, but shrimp have 508 chromosomes. How amazing is that? So we have far fewer chromosomes than lots of organisms on the planet. I just want to take a slight aside for a minute now and talk about briefly the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA because this is something that comes up and this is something worth you knowing. So let's think it through. We've already mentioned one here and that's that uh, in eukaryotes our DNA is wrapped around these big spherical proteins called histone proteins. Now these are only found in eukaryotic cells, so prokaryotes don't have histone proteins. So that's one difference. We also mentioned earlier that eukaryotic DNA is linear, whereas prokaryotic DNA is circular. We also mentioned that eukaryotic DNA is contained within the nucleus, whereas prokaryotic DNA is free-floating within the cell. So these are the three main differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA. Okay, that's everything that we're going to be learning about DNA for now. Obviously, you're going to be learning loads more about DNA as you go through the A-level. So you'll be learning about DNA replication. You'll also be learning about DNA and its role in protein synthesis. You'll be learning about the role of DNA in um, mitosis and meiosis and in hereditary and so on and so on. Because DNA is fundamental. Um, but what we've given you here is just a very brief intro to its structure. So let's turn next to RNA, ribose nucleic acid. And hopefully you can already tell from the name. The only difference between a nucleotide of DNA and RNA is that the pento sugar is ribose as opposed to deoxyribose in RNA. So that means that a ribose molecule has one extra oxygen atom, which is poking off the second carbon. You absolutely do not need to know it in that level of detail. You just need to know that it is the ribose sugar as opposed to the deoxyribose sugar. The other difference between DNA and RNA is the type of nitrogen-containing bases that they have. So we know that in DNA we have adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. But in RNA, there is no thymine. There is uracil. So in RNA, adenine binds to uracil and guanine still binds to cytosine. So those are two key differences in the structure of the nucleotide of an RNA molecule. But the second thing that we need to think about is what is the fundamental difference between RNA and DNA? We know that the job of DNA is to contain our genetic information, to act as the unit of hereditary, so to sit in the nucleus and to code for proteins and then to be passed on to our offspring so our offspring can code for the same proteins that we can code for. 
the functions of RNA are to be involved in the process of protein synthesis. So DNA is this huge molecule. It's far, far too large to be able to leave the nucleus. So what we do is create a small little chain of RNA that we call mRNA or messenger RNA that is an exact copy of the sense strand of DNA. And I'll, I'll talk you through what that term sense strand means in just a minute. So you have a single strand of mRNA that can be variable length depending on the length of the gene that it's from. And the job of mRNA is to head out of the nucleus and head off to the ribosome to be read. You'll learn a lot more about the roles of RNA when you do protein synthesis. So I'm just introducing you to these roles now. Then you've got ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA makes up about 50% of the body of a ribosome. And it's the ribosomal RNA that allows the ribosome to interact with the messenger RNA to help in this process of protein synthesis. And then the final RNA is called transfer RNA. Tr the job of transfer RNA is to go out into the cytoplasm and find a particular amino acid and then bind onto that amino acid and then bring that amino acid to the ribosome to be added to a growing polypeptide chain during protein synthesis. So don't worry about knowing too much about these jobs right now. It's just useful to have some of these terms so they're not brand new to you when you are being introduced to them when you do protein synthesis. So let's just have a look at the structures of the three and uh, their different functions. has unpaired bases, it is single-stranded and it's variable in length depending on the length of the gene that it has been made from. We can see that tRNA, which stands for transfer RNA, has two binding sites. It has an amino acid binding site at the top, which is specific to one particular amino acid, and it has an anticodon at the bottom. The anticodon is complementary to the codon, which is a set of three bases on the mRNA. And you'll learn more about that later on when you do protein synthesis. We can see that even though it's single-stranded, it's folded over into a very specific shape, meaning that some of the bases are paired due to the folding of the molecule. So it has both paired and unpaired bases. Now, it's often referred to as having a cloverleaf shape. And if you look up diagrams of it on the internet, it's a hugely complex structure. But I've just drawn a really simplified version of it. In fact, I often draw an even simpler version of it uh, when I'm going through it. And you'll see this when we do protein synthesis that just looks like that with the anticodon and the amino acid binding site there at the top because they're the two key bits that you need to know about. And then finally, we can see rRNA or ribosomal RNA. There's not really much you need to know about this one, just that it's found in the ribosome, it's of a fixed length, and it has unpaired bases. Now, there has been a lot of information <laughs> in this video, so take your time, get your head around it, read it through, check what you can remember, and see what questions that you have about it. But that's it for now. Well done.